Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be able to be here with you and to tell you about the site of Castentris and about some of the projects that we have been doing there. Because I've been working there for well over 20 years, um, we've covered a lot of ground, literally, and so I can't talk about all the things that we've done there. That would just take too many hours of your valuable time. So I've compressed it down and I'm covering a number of issues that link together around some questions about what do we know about how the fort was built and what does that tell us about the way in which Irish society in West Wales actually worked. There are also some implications and implications about that, about how we interpret that today and how the public can engage with it at the site because one of the unusual features about it is the way in which we have carried out experimental archaeology and reconstruction on the site, uh, which is open to the public, both to school parties and to the general public. And so at that point, I'm going to say, have any of you ever been to Castellanthes? And I'll see a few hands go up, see various people have been. Uh, so the rest of you who haven't been will be, I hope, inspired by this talk to book your holiday Pembrokeshire, so you could go and see it, and those of you who have been can encourage all the others to go and be stimulated by uh, seeing this site and the fantastic landscape around it too. So, on with what we're actually going to talk about. Many people ask, how did we know how to work, to do our work at the site? They imagine we used all sorts of high-tech gizmos to identify the site which was previously unknown. Well, that's not the case. Castle Hensley's has never been unknown. Uh, it was no, it's noted in many documents, and it's on this late 18th century map on the edge of the Hensley's estate. Uh, there's the house there, uh, late medieval and uh, early modern house, occupied until the 19th century when it becomes de is demolished. And here is the, the entren old entrenchments, as it's described on this uh, detail here. And these few fields here were later sold off from the estate and are now managed by the National Park, but as we shall see, were owned by others uh, before that. And so this site has never needed to be discovered. It's always been known. It's always been in elements of the archaeological literature. And the fact that it was known meant that when this man here, uh, dressed in his summer attire, for the rest of the year he was an accountant, um, <laughs> but in the summer he was dressed like this, um, he wanted to develop uh, an asterisk theme park, but couldn't get copyright permission. And so frustrated by that, he decided that he would uh, have a real high-age site, <coughs> an invented one, and he would reconstruct parts of it and open it to the public. Hugh Foster has a uh, sort of rather ambiguous relationship with the heritage industry. He uh, made a lot of money by being one of the co-founders of the London Dungeon, which some of you probably <coughs> should admit to having been to. So he did that, made money, uh, sold up, and then after a number of interesting, uh, slightly eclectic, uh, business opportunities, he then decided that this was the way forward. And as anyone interested in buying it in Ford in the 1970s and 1980s would do you browse the estate agents to try and find a suitable Desiree's Hill Ford for sale. He visited a number of them, believe it or not, that are for sale on various forms of estate and agricultural land for sale, and eventually he picked on this one. It had no public right of way, it had a reasonable access, it wasn't too high up, too big a hill in order to allow people to get to it easily. And so he purchased it. And then to his horror discovered it was a scheduled ancient monument and he couldn't do what he liked on it. And so he then uh, realised that he had to uh, obtain permission to do more work and through CADU, the Welsh National Agency, I was approached to carry out work. So that's why I'm working there. It's because of this man who had this fantastic vision. Uh, and this is the site. And you can see it's a lovely promontory, so I'll go back, lovely promontory, you can see the steep valley around it, uh, and this is the fort, middle of the 20th century, rather overgrown, as it was when he took over. But he had it cleared, and we were able to consider how we would go forward with our excavations. 
And so this is the site uh, much more recently. There is the promontory. Oops, sorry, I keep flicking this pointer. There's the promontory. There's the interior of the fort, about an acre, uh, with the defences across here, the entrance is here, and then there's an outer annex area here, again of about an acre, with very steep slopes down into the river, to the river valley on these sides, and a more easy approach on this side, but very steep uh, further away, up here, onto the Hensley's farm estate up there. So this is where we've spent so many years excavating and experimenting and as you can see, reconstructing. And there are a number of reconstructed buildings. This was taken after, soon after this one was completed. I'm going to be talking mainly about those for the purpose of keeping to time. And these little maps here will appear on some of the slides to indicate the layout of the settlement. The dark areas are the banks, the urban banks, and the paler areas are the ditches. Um, so that marks out the different areas, and that's the sort of angle of that picture. So, how did they build the fort? How did people come to be at this site? How did they build it? Well, as we'd conducted our excavations, we discovered that beneath uh, the uh, earthworks was the original boundary of the settlement, which was a, a trench to hold a fence in which lots of packing was put in, and in places the packing was still so well preserved you could see where every timber in the fence, the palisade around the site, was positioned. That was what, what it was like all the way along here. And we were able to identify the root, the root of that fence all the way around, most of the way around the site, all the way around the promontory, and then how it uh, joined up with where the entrance and it looks, though, though there are differing views about it, that it ran across here, joined the entrance, but also probably also ran across out here. In other words, it's bifurcated here, and there were two routes that joined the outer part of the entrance. It was quite a long entrance corridor. And this provided uh, an area that was enclosed within the contours of the hill. And the contours shown there are the contours as they were before the Iron Age people modified it. They modified the hill in a number of ways. So we can see how they used the natural topography to define the site by building not earthworks in the first place, but palisades. And we've done quite a lot of work thinking about what that meant. I don't suppose many of you have had to go and build a house and set up a settlement uh, from scratch. Have you? you get other people to do it for you if you are going to do that sort of thing. How would you do it? What are all the practical implications? And so we were looking at the sorts of things that are involved, now that we know what it's like, that are, that are necessary here. So there's 440 metres of palisade fence that needs to be constructed. Where do you get all the timber from? Where do you get the labour to dig the trenches, collect that timber, cut it, uh, put it together and make the set? The excavations have been sufficiently extensive that we can really think about the logistics of making a whole settlement from scratch. No one was living on this uh, site before uh, these people arrived to do it. So that's what the building of the hill fort initially is about. And that's what we've been exploring. And so this means there's a reasonably large area of coppiced land which was uh, available for them to harvest from, or they were bringing supplies in from a long way away, which seems unlikely. They also had to quarry the stone from the hill slopes to use as this packing stone. Some of it might be from agricultural fields, but most of it was fairly sharp and clearly had been freshly quarried. Inside the settlement <coughs> at this time, we find that the evidence, not in the middle because it's been damaged by erosion, but around the edges, we found evidence of the houses and the scooped areas, the little working areas which they set up while they were constructing and first living in this settlement. And we think this first period of the settlement was occupied for about 40 years, and gradually people would have arrived and this settlement would have been established. Again, most archaeologists don't think about this. They think about, oh, the settlement is established at about this date, and then 
it's changed in this way, and then it's changed in this way 100 years later, without thinking about the practical generational issues that are involved, which is by doing the reconstructions we've been forced to think about. And one of the other things that they did, beyond the main enclosure, was build, in this location here, what's called a cheveux de frise, this arrangement of stones. This is the original ground surface here of the Iron Age. When you're walking on that level, you are walking on what would have been the grass in the Iron Age. And they arranged these settings of stones with a very clear front edge across the saddle of the promontory, at a reasonable distance away from their palisaded saddle. And it's preserved because when they later built their earthworks, they buried this sugar de frise under the, ramp, the bank, which is what this is here. So that's the ditch they dug, the material from the ditch they threw up and put over the sugar de frise to make this bank here. And the entrance into the fort comes along past here. And so they're selecting stones. Many of these stones are uh, more worn, and they suggest that they're brought in from the fields. They're larger at this end, and they're much, much smaller at this end. And when they started to build the bank at first, at this end, they started moving the stones out of the way and threw them in here. And that's those little holes there are where the stones were taken out. So we can actually see where the stones were removed by the people who were building the, the, the earthwork. But then they realised that was pointless, or perhaps the significance of these stones was realised, and they were entombed within this rampart here, for us to find uh, centuries later. So all this is happening, the settlement is being established in about 400 BC. And we think that by about uh, 370 or so, the timbers in the palisade are rotting, and they are ready, they have established enough of their settlement that they are able to now build the earthworks. And this is a cross-section across the main earthwork that defines the northern part of the site. And you can see it's quite substantial, that's a metre, it's another metre. Uh, but in one, on one side there is this hole which this cheerful young lady is sitting in. She wouldn't have been so cheerful in the Iron Age because we found various stains in that and you can see that's the ground level there where the, the, the pit has subsided. <coughs> it subsided because of various carcasses. We don't know because of the acidity of the soil whether they were human or animal were clearly placed within this pit as a foundation offering which then, and they later then decomposed underground sunk. As many of you will know from going around churchyards today, you'll see how the ground uh, gets hollows where, where, they, where the coffin burials have collapsed up over time. So that's what's happened there. So that was the point up where they began to construct this rampart. And one of the things we've done is excavate a large amount of the rampart, you see just part of it here, which allows us to study uh, not only the way in which layers built upwards, but how they were built sideways. And this is very unusual. Most archaeologists haven't had the time or the resources, or perhaps have had better things to do. Uh, but we thought this was really important because no, most people don't understand how these earthworks, which are so iconic in the Iron Age, were actually put together. So by excavating a long length of it, we have been able to see how it's been put together. And that's what you'll see in a second. So it's really important for us to understand how they did this because it tells us about the groups of workers, how they operated, what their planning was, what they're trying to do. And this is the front edge of the ditch here outside the, the, the site. And you can see parts of the reconstructed settlement inside. And we're standing here looking more or less from the entrance. So I'm just going to go through these very, very quickly because the, the detail doesn't matter, it's the pattern that matters. Here's the, here's the pit with the votive deposits. There's a bit of spoil from the pit that was left after they filled it back in. And then we have some layers here that were the first layers that were taken from the ditch that were put down. And each picture that comes up, the grey tone area is the stage they've reached in building the rampart. And so we'll just see the rampart get bigger and bigger. I'm just showing part of it here just to show what we were able to find out. So then that was the bit, you can see the grey bit there, which was how we saw in the last picture, but now they've gone this direction. And now they've built more to build some height and moving it a bit towards the ditch. Then they're doing a bit towards the back, more towards the middle, getting more of the width, the original width, which get the final width, which comes down to here. 
and then they're putting more in here. So we can see how they're gradually building it up. No one's ever seen this for an Iron Age rampart before. No one's ever thought about how you do that. How the different baskets of material are brought up and dumped and where they're placed and how the work team is operated. So we're able to think about the way in which this rampart here has been put together. And when we excavated the rampart down here, this the smaller one that runs around the promontory, we found that was made quite differently. That was made with work <coughs> that were each doing a separate part of the rampart at the same time, and they were clearly taking the material from the, the, the ditch outside, very rocky area outside, and moving it up. And you can just see piles of material one against the other until they level up to make a series of mounds into one continuous uh, bank, which is not what they were doing here. Here the whole team were working one bit at any one time and moving first west, then east, and so on. So we've got a completely different way in which they're building this part to this part. And so they're building this earthwork here towards the entrance. And this is what the entrance uh, looked like when we uncovered it. With lots of stone walling, there's indeed also stone walling put around the uh, interior of the rampart here, bank here to hold it back, and guard chambers and large post holes for holding a timber gateway. Gate posts that doors swung against and slots in the sides of the walling for timbers to be pushed out of the way so you could open the gates and they were like barring the gates. They would come down and stop the gates being able to open. We haven't had the resources to reconstruct the gateway much as I would like to. So if any of you are feeling particularly benevolent, do see me afterwards and uh, uh, we would be very grateful for resources that allow uh, an experimental reconstruction of the gateway. But we have some good idea about how the gateway changed through time. This is how it is in the palisaded phase, when there's just a fence around the site, the Shubert Fries is out here, and it's still quite elaborate even at that time. It changes a number of times, even in that 30 years or so period. Then we have the period with the guard chambers, and all this walling around the edge here, and then this changes with the walling is altered, the guard chambers are changed, and then there's a period when there isn't a very formal gate at all. And this is taking place over the period sort of between sort of three, 370 is probably about here, and probably about 340, 350 is about here. So we're, we're seeing changes about every generation. And here you can see that there's a step in the walling, and that's filled in this period. And beneath that, we found not what looks to the modern eye like a larger number of Pembrokeshire uh, new potatoes scattered on the ground, but these are actually slingshots. Uh, a large horde of slingshots stored immediately behind the gateway. And the slingshots are excellent as a way of keeping people at a distance or beginning your attack of anyone who is uh, coming close before they get uh, close enough that they can easily attack you. And the Chevaux de Fries and the rampart that then covered it is at just the ideal distance for a lot of slingshot uh, movement. And we experimented with this with a number of people doing uh, slingshotting. We couldn't do it on the site because of all the tree cover around the hills, around the slopes, we couldn't really get a realistic uh, uh, representation of that. But we did it on Newport Beach early in the morning where we only had to shoo away a few dog walkers uh, because we didn't really want to um, see how effective the slingshots were <laughs> actually dealing with, with uh, attackers. We just wanted to see how far they, they could go. And so we were able to discover that this is an ideal range for which they uh, fired. And the top of this rampart was not with, marked with a fence with a palisade itself. It was a flat top. And that's ideal for this underarm form of uh, slingshot. So that's what we seem to be getting uh, here. So that Chevaux de Frise is out here. The entrance is here. The palisade is here. But then Chevaux de Frise is covered by earthworks. And the earthworks are constructed by all those teams of people working two banks of ditches on this side one on this side, the stone entrance made, and the rampart out here. But 
We'll now turn to how did they build the inside of the fort. Now the inside of the fort originally was filled with houses. We've only been able to rebuild a few of them, but we know that there were houses down this side, down this side, and houses down the middle. Only in the area immediately inside the entrance was there an open area. Everywhere else was full of houses. So it's slightly confusing for the public to go and only see some buildings, but some of the others have now been marked out with no timbers to try and indicate their sort of plan for the whole set. But these themselves are extremely interesting and evocative. As anyone of you who've been there will know, it really is quite an amazing experience to go into these roundhouses. It's a better experience for the casual visitor if there aren't 30 exciting school children inside one of the roundhouses. But if there are, then you get a different sort of experience of how much room there is or is not inside one of these. So we'll have a look at these houses what we found on them, and how we were able to build these structures. In other words, how they probably, possibly built these houses, and how we think that happened, and what implications that has in many ways. So we'll start with the first one that was constructed. Um, we excavated it in 1981, and it was constructed in 1982. So it's now the longest standing modern Iron Age house in Britain. Because all the ones at Butzer, which were constructed before those, uh, had to be moved because the Butzer site moved. So these are now the longest in the same place. And a lot of the timbers in this building are still the same timbers that were put up all that time ago. So that shows how long these houses can last already. We can see how long these houses last without having to completely be rebuilt. It's been repatched a number of times, but completely rebuilt, not necessary. So this is the plan of our excavation of this particular part of the site. It's very unprepossessing when you see it in a photograph. The, the features are all very shallow, but there was sufficient evidence for us to begin to make sense of it. So let's start going through this and see what we can see. So lots of uh, post holes, bits of gullies, and the house was rebuilt here a number of times. So they don't all belong to the same house. But we can see uh, substantial doorposts at the bottom here in red, and then a ring of posts inside. The yellow ones was bits, it was very soft soil, and there were bits of animal disturbance here, and we'll see in the uh, slide with one of the other houses later, uh, which meant that some bits of the archaeology were less well preserved. But this, this is a ring of posts uh, that's running around inside the house, and here is uh, the, the big, here are the big doorposts. And these, this arrangement of a ring of posts is found in a lot of Iron Age houses. They're called double ring roundhouses. And they're double ring because the wall itself isn't between those posts, but is actually further out. So in fact, this bit of gully here is the gully that the house wall sat in. And you can see these post holes over here. This is another house on the same site. We don't know whether it was before or after, where they weren't putting the posts in a gully, but they were putting them in individual post holes. And you can see there, can't you, that they form a nice curve, very similar to the curve here. And these are probably ones the same. So that house would have been very fractionally bigger. Yep. Everybody see that? Everyone's still convinced? Yeah, right, good. Uh, so this provides us with this double ring uh, roundhouse. And we can see that the doorposts are on the wall line of the house. Some Iron Age houses have a porch and there are posts in front of the door itself. That's not the case with any of the houses we have there, all uh, door ones without a porch. And in fact, this is the only house on the site with this double ring. And this shows the problem of doing a small excavation on something like a hill fort. If this had been the only house we had excavated, we would have thought this was the norm. But in fact, it was the only house that had the double ring type. Just as one of the very few features that we excavated here produced a piece of Iron Age pottery, which very much excited me because there isn't very much Iron Age pottery from West Wales, and it was I think six or seven years before before we found another piece. Okay, so it's and we have a very very small shoebox, being more than ample to hold all the pottery that belongs to the Iron Age from the whole of the set. So uh, it just shows how if you excavate for a very short time and only a little bit of the site, you can 
get very misled. So we now have a framework for ha ha the house, but what about anything else that might help us think about the reconstruction? We have an outer ring, and the outer ring is linked to this here, <coughs> which has a wiggle in it, which uh, in discussions with people afterwards I could explain why, what I think is going on there, but for, for simplification we'll just ignore that. I haven't ignored it, but we'll ignore it for now. Uh, that there is this outer ring, and that's the ring, uh, what's called an eavesdrip gully, that's where the water <coughs> falls off the, the roof. So that tells us how far out beyond the wall the roof extended. And we don't have it all the way around, partly because, as we see, not everything survives, and partly because of the slope of the ground, I think, and what they're trying to do with the wall, with, with the wall and with the, with the water from the roof. So we have these key pieces of information. We have the plan, and we have the distance out from the wall that the roof stretched. So that gives us some key pieces of information, but that's still only 2D. Okay? Did you see the Doctor Who episode that was all about the aliens that were 2D rather than 3D? Well, the archaeologists are often working in 2D, but we all live in a 3D world, don't we? So how do we make this 2D plan into a 3D structure? How did they build the house, what, how do we think they did it? Well here we have uh, an isometric drawing, a cutaway drawing, of that house. There's the doorway, the wall, the roof, the roof coming over the right distance to line up with where we think, the, where we have the gully, and we have the inner ring of posts. And how does that roof work? So we experimented, we thought about it, uh, we, have, we decided that around the top of the post ring would be a ring of timbers and then rafters would stretch from those down onto the wall and then other rafters would go up to the apex and only very few would go the whole distance because A, there would, there would be, have to be very long timbers, straight timbers and B, if you have too many going to the top you end up with an enormous amount of wood at the, the point of the cone here. So by having it only some of them going up, and some others going up from, the, from this, this stage, you can create a much more effective pattern. And then you have little purlins, little thinner pieces of wood that run around concentrically, and it's onto those that you then tie the bundles of reed. And these are bundles of reed that come from the nearby estuary at Nevin, uh, where the River Nevin goes out at Newport, and there are big reed beds there, and most of the reeds were cut from there, up to about there on the round on the house originally. The hippies that the owner employed to do the cutting had a rather iron age sense of time management, and uh, by the time the um, birds started nesting and therefore the cutting had to stop in modern uh, conservation parlance, the hippies hadn't cut enough reeds. So the top part of the house had to be thatched with reeds that came all the way from Hungary. It's the only place you could get reeds in a hurry. So, that, in fact, you couldn't tell the difference between the Hungarian reeds and the Welsh reeds, something that perhaps we should bear in mind when we're having all these discussions about immigration at the moment. There's no difference at all between Hungarian and Welsh reeds. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the nature of the, the roofing. And the roofing is at an angle which allows for really effective runoff of water, any snow that might appear or anything like that, and we know how far beyond the wall it has to go. And we have it going really low in all these pictures, because uh, I think that that's a really important feature because it protects the walling from erosion, from wind and rain, from frost action of getting wet and then freezing. Not that it freezes a lot in this part of the world. And it's a much more effective structure. It also creates storage space around the bottom where you can store wood and tools and so on. So we think that's how they constructed it. And we know quite a lot about the materials necessary to do that. So quickly on to another house, so you've got some idea of some comparison. So that was the first house we excavated and reconstructed. We then carry on excavating across here and found enough of the remains of this house. Doesn't look very auspicious there. The first house is about 10 metres in diameter. This one is 6 metres, so much smaller. Um, but uh, we had enough, we thought, to make an idea of its plan. No internal ring of post now. We also were excavating elsewhere and found how... Some of the houses had individual 
arrangements of stone. So these bits of packing, we saw that with the first house, that outer ring of posts that was a different phase. Here, you, can you see these little upright stones going round in an arc? These are where put in round each of the upright timbers in the wall of a house. There's a wall put in a gully. Here is a different phase of the same house plot with the houses, with the timbers. So we've got some idea about the distance here. We've got some idea with the packing of the palisade, the sort of distances. So various ways in which different sorts of experiment and reconstruction, we know what we ought to be trying to do. But we still have to think of the structural elements. Now with the previous roundhouse, the weight of this roof is largely carried and co made coherent by this ring beam. And the timbers just rest on this wall here. And they rest down on the uprights in this wall, the individual uprights in the wall. That's not really suitable for this sort of building because uh, there's nothing up here to really hold it all together. And if this wall in any way rots, or the upright in it rots, then the, the roof could easily collapse. So what we have to do is spread the load, spread the risk. And we do that by having this wall plate, this overlapping wall plate that runs around the top of the wall. And then the, then the rafters can rest anywhere on that wall plate, not necessarily where there are uprights in the wall. And so that's how we constructed that. And here you see people actually doing the reconstruction. You can see the bottling there. It was a very th therapeutic exercise, mixing the clay, the cow dung, the horse hair, the straw together, getting it all suitably wet, and then slapping it on. And you have people inside slapping it on, and people outside slapping it on, and they all get spattered by each other's slapping as they slap it all on. But eventually, the whole of these walls are covered, they're smoothed down, they dry out, they all crack, you put more on, you smooth it out, and you end up, in effect, with a clay wall with the, with the wattling inside it. And so then, if that wattling uh, gets weakened and the timbers in the, in the wall get weakened, then by rotting, the, basically it becomes a clay wall, supported on the top by this wall plate, which then supports the roof. And so that building has, has been uh, re-roofed a number of times, but uh, and now actually has a rather sadly shorter roof than I would like it to have. The older pictures show what go closer to the ground. But um, the, the basic structure of it has not had to be altered again at all. And that only went up a year after the other one. So again, these are long-lasting buildings. You could tear them down after a very short time, but you don't have to. So we'll then move on and look at the third one that we uh, excavated and reconstructed uh, in its entirety. And we see uh, an aerial uh, sort of... From a, photographic tower view of this from, the, from, from this side, from just beside this first house. And you can see there's a very deep wall trench here. The entrance is actually there. That pit belongs to a different period. Those are the trenches there are part of other houses that were originally here, and this one was constructed a bit further towards the middle of the set. So we have a deep wall trench here, round to the doorway. There's an animal disturbance there. And then we have a thin little shallow trench up here, which continues the circle of this building. And this one's again back, back to about 10 metres in diameter, so it's the same size as the first one. There's the first one in the background. There's the second one. Okay. And so we thought, well, this is really interesting. How are we going to reconstruct that? And you can see here the beginning of the process of doing the reconstruction further activity here, getting some of the wall plate on. There's Hugh Foster uh, about to be doing some enthusiastic doorway, and these people looking rather worried about what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so here we see the here we see the reconstruction beginning. But we excavated this evidence, no internal ring of posts at all, even though it's 10 metres in diameter, which is quite a reasonable size. If you paste that out in your garden, you'll see that's quite a reasonable size. So what was going on there? What did this house do? How did it work? So let's have a look at this picture of the house. Now, does anyone notice anything perhaps unusual or different about that house from the others? See if any of you are awake. Does anyone see anything different about that house? 
Because this house was built, as you can see, on more of a slope. And because it's on more of a slope, the wall, for the wall plate, because there's no posts inside to hold the roof up, for the wall plate to be horizontal, the wall has to be quite small here and very tall there for the, for the wall plate to be horizontal. And it has to be horizontal, otherwise the roof will just slide off. <laughs> Not a good idea. So that is why the, tra the wall trench on this side is so deep, and the wall trench on this side is so shallow. It's related to the height of the wall that it's actually supporting. And so suddenly doing the reconstruction made sense of what people in the Iron Age had sensibly thought ahead to do. But it also made it a real pain to do the reconstruction because you can see here we're putting the timbers in, but these each then had to be cut so that the tops of them were level. So unlike the other houses where you could have it all almost prefabricated and then put it up, with this one you had every had every post had to have its right place at the right height. So it was much more complicated to make this house than any of the others. Uh, and it just shows that building on a slope, if you're in the Iron Age, is not necessarily a very good idea. <laughs> we'll come back to that in a minute. But, uh, but by doing this, we have learned an awful lot. We didn't have a very effective ring beam in here, and in fact the park, because this is used for school parties to have tales from the Iron Age told by, by storytellers, uh, the park were worried about burying school children in the bad publicity of that result, and so they actually have timbers inside that prop up them. They're not structurally necessary, and we're hoping that when they rethatch it, which will be happening, I hope, soon, we can restructure the roof so that we can get rid of these posts. And again, it's an experiment to see what would happen if we did a different roof structure. And we found through our failures in that what they must have done, because that does work, and what we did wasn't very successful at this particular time. So that's, that's another valuable experience. You learn more with these experiments when things go wrong than when everything goes right. But try telling the sponsors that. Okay, so uh, the, the, the roundhouse here was a very different experience. And that explains why so many of the houses on the steeper slopes, and we see this on hill forts in many parts of Britain, they dig a scoop to make a horizontal area for the house. Okay, so that's what you do. It's much easier to dig a horizontal area and put a house up than put a house onto the slope. It also is much easier to then live inside a house without a full sloping floor. And it's unclear whether they actually had a false floor that actually was horizontal, whether they had a timber floor uh, or something like that to make it easy to use. Otherwise, when you're all sleeping in that house at night, you'd all, wake, you'd all go to sleep in your different parts of the house, and of course you'd all wake up uh, all in a big bundle at one end uh, in the morning. So clearly there are practical issues about having a sloping floor, which perhaps um, most of the time the Iron Age people were well aware of and solved by making these scoops. And this is another sort of house which we haven't yet reconstructed. It's the next sort I would like to do there if I get the chance. And that's a house, this one on the scoop. This one, one of the houses of the Palisaded settlement, uh, preserved beneath the bank. That's the floor of the house. We have bits of flooring in this one which was partly burnt down when it was being demolished. We had all the edges of the, of the uh, bottom and door. But both of these, the floor is well preserved near the wall and the wall didn't go into the ground. It's basically built on the surface. So on the, completely on the surface here and built against the edge of the scoop here and out into flat ground out here, there is no wall trench. So clearly Iron Age houses could be constructed without having to go into the ground at all. A rather horrifying prospect for all of us doing the Iron Age 
trying to work out how many houses there were in any one settlement and how many people lived anywhere. But it's only by having done these experiments and having thought about this, I will now know how to build a house with no uh, foundations. And I now feel that I have the experience that would allow me to do so, and it would still stand up. And that is my next task to actually demonstrate that. But this is a really important piece of information, which again, linking the building with the excavating, allows us to think through and think of the implications. We also have a very small number of four post structures. One, two, three, he's got to make it a number, four in there, little, little square or rectangular arrangements. And they're normally shown as reconstructed like these. People lived in roundhouses, here with what I think are remarkably short uh, roofs. That's that they work well when you've got fiberglass guttering, but I'm not so convinced they work well without. Uh, so uh, that's how they've done them, and that's how they've done these little chalet four-poster granaries. They're thought to be granaries. You raise the floor up, and you saw your goods away from vermin and the damp. Um, with that, I'm happy. The, this arrangement, I'm not saying it never happened, but I don't believe it's necessarily the only solution. My solution, for some people, is a step too far. It's to put a round building on a square arrangement of post -holes. If you ask someone to do a join the dot puzzle and you give them a square of dots, they will join them up with square lines. So here we have our frame of it, so they'll join it up like that. That's how you do it. You remember doing those ones where you join the dots and discover it was an elephant or whatever it was? Well, you join the dots and you discover it's a square. Well, if you have curving lines, you can join the dots and make a circle. So no reason why it has to be a square. So what we have done here is we have made a platform and then we have augered holes for the upright timbers of the wall to go into on this platform and made a, a building exactly like the ones that are in the ground or on the ground. And this building, again, has stood for now a considerable length of time. It was probably two years after this last one that we constructed this, just before Hugh Foster sadly died. Uh, this site was put up for sale, and unfortunately, the National Park, Hampshire Coast National Park, bought it, and we were able to carry on our excavations. And a lot of investment in the public interpretation came about because of their enthusiasm for this site, which they manage to this day. When you go and visit it, not when I say, not in, when you go and visit it, you will actually see all the efforts that they put into interpreting it and making it a really interesting and valuable uh, visitor experience. But here we have a four-post structure which works really effectively by bringing the roof right down. You don't get any uh, wind coming underneath and threatening the stability of the building. It is completely effective. And again, that has withstood hurricane force winds and withstood everything that could be thrown at it. So I think that's a very good idea. So from this, we have some idea about the way in which they constructed the earthworks and the way in which they built their buildings. There are always caveats, always questions. The great thing about the site and people going to it is they can answer those questions with the interpreters, they can think about it themselves. They're tremendously stimulating places to visit and think about, sit in the houses and think about how they would have worked. We have to kit out the inside. If you go to Butts, so often the insides are fairly barren because we don't know what went in, in them. We took a different approach. We thought that they should be full of things that the people would have used. They may not be in all details correct, not that we would ever know that, but it's better to have them full of things because they would have been full of things rather than uh, empty of things, which gives quite the wrong impression. And so we have various things, benches, uh, central hearth, beds, where there's the ring of posts, there are various ways you can subdivide that with, uh, with textiles and so on, uh, ha hanging stuff from the seat, from the rafters. Some of you may have them, had the misfortune of watching the Iron Age, surviving the Iron Age television series, <laughs> which was filmed at Cassandra's uh, Many a story can be told about the daring news or otherwise uh, that went into the making and making of that series. But uh, suffice to say that that series reveals that we're not very good at living in anything remotely like the Iron Age. And that does make it very difficult for us to empathise with what it was like. So that series was a lesson in our ignorance, not only the ignorance of the participants, but really many of our ignorances. So um, I wouldn't suggest you watch that series should you get the chance to do so, 
to learn about the past, you learn about people struggling in the present. But you, it does make us realise that we need to think quite differently about how people lived in the past. And therefore, whether it was like this or not is very difficult to say. But it does at least make us think about it. And at least some aspects, like how they constructed the site, how they built the houses, how long they could be maintained, we do have information about. I think that's really important for us to understand. So, although this picture might suggest to the contrary, we can't actually interview people from the Iron Age and ask them why they did anything and how they did it. We have to infer that to ourselves from a period before there was any documentation. We have Castahentes being occupied in this part of the site, in this form, from the about 400 BC through to perhaps between 150 to 50 BC. So not an incredibly long time, but quite a lot of generations of people. And we can get some idea of how over the generations that settlement was maintained, adapted, changed after that initial pioneering period of building the palisade and then building the earthworks. We've got some idea about how it was defended and how it worked, how the agriculture worked, which I don't know how to talk about today. But really, there are many aspects of the past that we don't know. But by doing these reconstructions, by thinking through people's thought processes, planning, organising the landscape, we begin to get some insights that just doing the digging and writing up the relics that we find will never get us. So with that, I'll stop so that you may wish to ask me any questions. Thank you very much.